Hey everyone, welcome back to Adherent Apologetics. As always, we're brought to you by you with your support on patreon.com slash Adherent Apologetics. Today I'm joined by Leighton Ryder. He's a university studying who's majoring in history and minoring in religious studies. Um, he's done a lot of work. He studies a lot of different fun things. And he studies medieval European ecclesiastic reform and mystic history especially. So lots of big fun words there. And today we're going to be talking about uh, medieval mystic history and the life of someone named Margaret Poirier. Uh, I know I butchered that because I don't speak French. She's a Belgian mystic who was burned in 1310 for heresy. We're talking about her life, mysticism, and so much other fun stuff. But Leighton, welcome, man. How are you doing? Good. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. I'm really pumped to talk to you. This is kind of like a unique topic, which makes it so fun for me. Yeah. It's like something you wouldn't think of. Just like, what am I going to talk about today? Medieval mysticism and like right. – burnings on the stake and all that fun stuff so like it's a lot of fun but before we get into that can you talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do yeah yeah so as zach said my name is layton i'm a fourth year history student in canada here um, i study at the university of mount royal uh, that's in calgary alberta and right now we're going through my honors thesis on the combination execution of marguerite Poret. Um, and then zach gave a brief overview on what she was she's a a begin mystic in the 1300s um yeah and so far that's kind of what my degree has been focusing on it started out super broad um didn't mean to do history at the beginning but went from world war ii history and then found myself falling in love with medieval history and then the classics it's a lot of fun i've been reading Tom Holland's book Dominion. I don't know if you're familiar with it, and I've just been like he's been going know. through like the history of Christianity, and I'm like, dang, there's a lot here. So, what got you lot. interested specifically in like medieval history and like Mar Margaret Poirier, who I'm probably gonna keep butchering her name throughout the rest. All of good. Time. I'll, I'll keep correcting it. All this? <laughs> ah, yeah. Like it was definitely when my when I when I became a Christian. When I started my degree, I wasn't a Christian. I was agnostic, atheist. Didn't really care. Then something clicked where I became a Christian and started to want to incorporate my faith into my schoolwork. It started out with doing uh, Bible verses in essays to uh, set professors, you know, catch this, maybe, maybe it'll trigger something. Um, and then as my faith developed in Christianity, I was like, wow, like I want to know my, the history of my faith. And even more so because medieval history is quite convoluted and maybe misconstrued in some cases. Um, so I want to take it upon myself to address the good and bad. Um, mm. But also, yeah, to affirm that it's not all bad. Um, like there are women like Marguerite Poret who who were living their faith, probably similar to me what a Pentecostal would, would do today. Just mm. very exuberant, um, expressive about their faith and doing missional work. Um, so why yeah. oh, no, no, sorry, Joe. keep going you're good yeah and so like what, what got me into to her um my supervisor and i were, were talking about it dr emily hutchison um we were just talking about these ideas and initially i wanted to do islamic history and christian experience but um there's something about margaret Poret. she was made as a heretic made up to be a heretic uh, writing a book but there's something a little bit more different about her it's not so simple and so that's what i'm doing with my my thesis mm -hmm. good stuff so i think for a lot of people uh they can look at like history and be like oh this doesn't matter like why is this like apologetics youtube channel slash podcast talking about like history shouldn't you be talking about like philosophy or like biblical studies or something like that like so for someone who would say like why is all this like history and medieval and mysticism like why does it even matter what would you say yeah and i definitely feel like that sometimes like Sometimes I look at my degree and I'm like, ah, I wish I could be a historian or a, a theologian or a philosopher. But I think that there is importance in history, especially for Christians. And especially when we are living in a contemporary church as we are now, where at least in North America, evangelical, evangelicalism is quite popular. I notice that we are straying further and further away from traditional church and the universal uh, eternal church, which is the body of Christ, so all ages at all times. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge the stuff that happened, the, the bad stuff, so that we don't repeat it and we be more like the body of Christ. 
but also to see the, the good things in the church, especially during this time, um, when it be a little bit harder to see things like that. Mm. Yeah, so one thing I, 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 a common stereotype that we'll hear of like the medieval period or like the dark ages, like from the time of like the fall of Rome to the Renaissance is like, oh, it's this dark period where the church ruled with an iron fist and they killed everyone and it was brutal and no one was happy and they all cried and there was this black plague and all this stuff. So we get this, stere this stereotype of like the late middle ages, middle ages and the medieval periods. But what do you think? Is there any truth to that? And like when you're studying this, like, is it different than that stereotype? So there, there is truth to it, like certainly, like the church was very influential. It was authoritative, um, but it wasn't so much, say, with the inquisitions. It wasn't so much that we thought that or the church thought that this was a heretic. And so we immediately burned them. No, no. Often there was a, a trial held, like for Marguerite Porat, she had a number of trials held. Um, she's a bit of a a badass, if I can say that, um, in that she never, she never spoke at her trials. She was quiet the whole time. Um, and then once a trial was preceded, then it would be given over to the secular section of the, um, the estates. So there's three estates. There's the nobility, the clergy, and then the, the peasantry, which is just the, the common people. But the church wouldn't ever do any of the executions um, it was always the, the nobility or the, um, the secular branch. Um, but yeah, that's not to say that it was, that there was no order to it. There, there was order. There was a process. There were trials given. Um, now punishment would be a little bit more radical than what we, we think of today. Um, but even for Marguerite Porat and the Bates, um, it wasn't always chop off the head or burn them. Sometimes it was just execution. And in the Council of Vienne, which is 1311 to 1312, one year after Port's execution, um, that's the punishment for being a begging is just, it's excommunication. And then five years later, it's being burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's not always so cut dry that the church was authoritative and brutal. Right, right, right. Um, so, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> something I'd love to look into further, like if I did a, a master's thesis, which is the goal, is to kind of look at the things that the church did that was good and beautiful and where the bride of Christ is imitating Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, good stuff, man. So we're going to be talking about, I'm just looking at my notes to try to pronounce her name, like Marguerite Por Poriet. Um, before we do that, she's part of like this Christian mysticism movement that we have in the medieval period. And like mysticism can sound very mystic. Like it's literally in the name, mm -hmm. but like if you could like break down like the medieval Christian mystic movement, like what was it and what were they doing? Yeah. So there's a few different things. It wasn't, so Marguerite Poret's part of the Beguines, mm -hmm. which was a lay non-monastic group. And it's important to focus on the non-monastic part of it. Um, that means that unlike the Franciscans or the Dominicans, she didn't, or they didn't affirm monastic vows. Mm -hmm. So they were never under the authority of the Pope, which was an issue. It made them controversial. Um, but then you have the spirituals, which were more mystical versions of the Franciscans. Um, and most, I mean, people don't know, is most of these mystic movements um, might seem weird or spooky but they came out of an, Ag an Augustinian tradition. So like in Confessions where Augustine is personifying love, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these mystic traditions are coming out of that and they're also personifying love. Um, and love I'd say is the most important thing, at least to the, the, the Beguines, is to have love for God above all things and that love is the the most important virtue, not reason or knowledge like the scholastic theologians might have thought, like Aquinas and St. Bonaventure. Um, and they weren't heretical either. Um, I think that there's a big difference between the occult and mysticism. Mm -hmm. And mysticism, I think, still falls within that safe space of heterodoxy and orthodoxy. It's just a more 
romantic, a more euphoric way of demonstrating faith. Mm. So let's talk about um, the life of M Margaret Poyet and just like um, her journey and just unpack her life for us. Just take us through, take as much time as you want and talk about like her cool. story and wh why you think it's so important, the story worth telling. Yeah, so Marguerite Poirot, she was born in 1250 in Belgium. And then at some point in her life, she moved to, to France and Paris, France, which is big at this time because Paris, France at this time is kind of like Broadway, New York for theatrics. Paris, France in the 1200s and throughout classic period is a theological hub of the Christendom. Um, so she, she moves there and she starts writing. Um, she likely came from a wealthy family because she has access to scribes who are writing down her work and distributing it, um, translating into different languages, Latin, French, English, and maybe Italian. Uh, the first three for certain. Um, but yeah, she writes the book called The Mirror of the Simple Souls. That's what this is here. Um, and it's a book mostly about annihilation, not annihilation as in hell, but annihilation of the soul or of the will. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, yeah, so she distributes the, this book and she gets mixed reviews on it. There are some masters and theologians and clergy who, who love it, who affirm her in it, like um, Godfrey Fontaine's. He's a, um, a metaphysicist or a theologian during this time. Um, he's not too common now, but he was big then. Um, so he, he affirms her, her work, which is significant, um, being that she's a woman. But then you have other theologians, um, like the Bishop of Cambrai at the time, who says that it's, it's not good. She shouldn't be distributing it. Um, and so she's warned a first time that she shouldn't dis distribute it. And if she does, then she will face an inquisition. Um, so she takes that warning and she says, stuff it. And she goes and adds on to the book and continues writing the mirror until it's finished. The second time um, she's caught distributing it. Then she's taken in by the inquisition and her trial's held. Um, and then it's in her trial that she's condemned to execution, burned at the stake. And then she's burned in Paris, France in 1310 for being a relapsed heretic. Um, now, What's really interesting about the trial record is that it is very, very quiet on her actual heresy. It says that the book, the mirror was in error, but that's about it. Usually when we see heresy like this or any kind of medieval heresy, they're gonna heap on the things that they did wrong um, just to really prove without a doubt that they were a heretic. Um, but with Marguerite Porette, it's not, it's not her, her heresy that they emphasize, but her rejection of male authority and in subordination to the inquisitors. Um, she disobeyed the Bishop of Cambria the first time when she was not told not to publish it. Then she published it again and she got caught. And then with her inquisitor, William of Paris, um, she wouldn't respond to him ever. Um, and that's what I argue is the reason why she was burned at the stake. Um, but the reason why I think she's just so fascinating and important is she doesn't show up very often in the secondary sources. Um, secondary sources, you might, are you familiar with secondary sources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Primary sources. Yeah, like I thought so. Secondary, like kind of comes out later, yeah. Yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so secondary sources yeah, are sources. Like, glass here and there. Yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> um, for people that don't know, secondary sources are sources that are produced from historians um, like Th Tom Holland who are writing about the, the time. Um, not a lot of historians write about her. And so as a historian, you love to jump on stuff um, and make an improvement to it and add. Uh, what makes her really special, I think, is just her, her struggle and experience. She's a woman in this time writing a very influential, important work, I think. Um, she has big ideas and she wants to be a, maybe not a leader, but a teacher or a helper in the church and she doesn't get the opportunity and so it's probably because of that i want to give her agency and bring her story up there's another thing too with 
medieval theologians and scholastic historians. Uh, we love to talk about Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure, um, all these, these male theologians. But I also want to give emphasis to women who are writing intellectual works at the time as well, um, just because they're not as brought up, but mm. are also important, especially even for looking back to the body of Christ and the eternal church. It's not important just to not only mention the men, but also to acknowledge the, the women who have given time and their lives in Brett's case mm. to um, emphasizing Christ. Right, so much good stuff. So when you think of like the li life of M Margaret, Mar Mar I'm just not going to try. Um, All good now. When you think about her life, like what you talk about this emphasis on like not just looking at um, the men in church history in this scholastic period, but also the women like her, like what do you think makes her so special? Um, like when you, you're writing a thesis on her, like what do you admire so much about her and just her life and her work? There's a few things. First of all, uh, I admire that she's able to get a, get an audience. Um, there are some women like Hildegard of Bingen. She was a woman in the, I think the late, the late 12th century. So in the late 1100s, she was writing to the nobility on how a nobility could be saved. Um, kind of my right kings, kings type of thing where if you're born into a higher nobility, it's because God wanted you there. Uh, and your salvation was secure. Kind of some theology. Um, what I love about Margaret Porat is she's not writing to the nobility. She's writing to the lame, the poor, the weak, people like you and me. Um, and she believes in salvation for all people. Mm. Um, and so that's one thing that drew me to her is that her mission was for the people who were thought to be last. That's kind of thing about the last will be first and first will be last type of thing. The second thing that's really interesting about her, she's writing in the early 1300s. Martin Luther doesn't come around till 15, well, he doesn't do the thesis until 1517. Uh, but she's got some early Protestant writing in there. And as an Anglican Protestant, it's really cool to see the first little hairs of early Protestantism. Like there's John Wycliffe in England. Um, and I, I don't make a heavy argument for it, but you could definitely make an argument that Margaret Porat and the Bagians are doing the same kind of thing, where there's there's hints of early Protestantism, there's rebellion against the the church. She literally says, um, "It's faith without works that earns salvation," mm. which at this time is crazy because. In the Catholic tradition, it's works and faith. Um, and then the third thing I think for her is just her her stubbornness is is funny, and it's uncommon, especially for a woman during this time. You know, during this time, women were expected to be to be meek and chaste, um, to be quiet. Um, Augustine once says that a woman is such if she is a virgin virgin, a widow, or a wife. And those were kind of the roles of women. But Marguerite Poirier kind of breaks out of that paradigm um, mm -hmm. where she wants to be involved in this theological discussion. Um, she wants to be involved in these theological debates. Um, she doesn't make it to the universities because women weren't permitted to be masters at this time. There were women who taught, but it's more in the role of medicine and law, not theology. There's instances of women who disguise themselves to be to look like men so they could do theology, um, but they they weren't included in that academic space, unfortunately. Um, and so it's just the, those those three things I think draw me to her so much, and I admire her for it. Um, I think even when you're being persecuted for your your ideas, as she was, she went to she went to the stake without saying a word. I think shows her her steadfastness as well that like she she believes what she wrote and she thought it was effective for the salvation of the people she was writing to mm. so it seems like like looking at her life 
there's so much there in terms of like your impact on like women in the church and like how do we view this question um very revolutionary at the time so when you look at her life and reflect on women in the church and debate like what makes her so special and kind of like examining this question that we as christians uh, yeah so like what makes her special and women in the the church is that um, she she does exceed that that paradigm, and then right now in the church, I think we're still kind of struggling with, like, what what do we do? A lot of a lot of denominations have become open to women pastors and leading in the church, and other denominations um, see women as more of like a, a deacon role, not an ordained priest role to give sacraments. Um, and so, looking at Margaret Perrette, I think we can see an example of a woman who is trying to find her place in this role. Like I said, I don't think she's trying to become a leader um, because that was a strictly male role at the time. But I think she she has a heart for, for teaching. And uh, and I think uh, that that's really important. Mm. So another interesting topic that we can kind of like um, unpack here is this idea of heresy. I remember earlier you talked about her being like burned at the stake but yeah. it's very different like in like the literature, like regarding like why she was burnt and like the mystery there. So like when you're looking at like her life and like heresy and all these things happening in like the medieval period, like what's going on and like, how did like the medieval church view heresy and like, why was she mm -hmm. exactly like burnt at the stake and you know, all that mess of stuff. Yeah. So in uh, 1215, the Catholic church or, the church sorry um the, the church has um the fourth lateran council this is a big big council it sets the sets doctrine theology orthodoxy already up to the council of trent um so it's a huge a huge standardization of christianity number three is on heresy um canon number three is on, on heresy and the opening line is something like heresy is that which contradicts the orthodox holy catholic faith um that's a pretty clear definition of what heresy is yeah um and then you're like okay well what's the what's the holy orthodox catholic faith um and then canon one answers that and it's what you and i would expect it's the athanasian creed it's the nicene creed the apostles creed um, it's the affirmation of God and the creation of the, of the earth. So anything in contradiction to that is, is a heresy at the, that time. Mm. Um, and there's a really cool theory by another historian who specializes in uh, medieval heresy, R.I. Moore. He says that at this time, the scholastic period, 1200s through the 1500s, um, there's two forms of heresy that the church perceives. The first kind is the kind of thing that Marguerite Porette, if she was guilty of a heresy, would be this heresy. Um, and the Beguines like her. She, she wasn't alone in, in her ideas. There were other Beguine women. Um, but R.I. Moore says the first kind of heresy is um, a seeking out to reform the church. Um, is the easiest way to, to, to put it. So what Luther does would have been a, a heresy, but that's what the Beguines are trying to do in the uh, the 1300s, is they're trying to reform the church. There is a, uh, a contemporary of Marguerite Porette called Metchthild of Majburg. Yeah. Um, she writes a book called The Flowing Light of the Godhead. And in it, she calls out the clergy, calling them greedy, sinful thieves and that the order of the priest has fallen to lower standards of men. And so today we we, we would read that and be like, wow, like good for her for calling that out. But mm. then that was a opposition or a threat to the authority of the church. And so that would have been a heresy. She never got, much still the measure never got burned for heresy, but that would be something controversial. Um, so that's that, that's the first kind of heresy that R.I. Moore talks about is trying to reform the church at this time. The second one is like legit heresies, like the the, the Cathar heresy or the Arian heresy. 
something that blatantly goes against the orthodoxy of the Christian faith. Mm. So saying that Jesus was just a man, um, there is no divinity to him or that um, the Trinity is not three persons of one God, it is three separate gods. Mm. Those are the second kind of heresy, but that's not what's going on with Marguerite Porette. Um, I think it's the first one. Um, but yeah, so those, those are the, the two kinds of heresies that are going on at the, the time. And I'm even, I'm sure that there's other historians who could even contribute more nuanced ideas of what, what heresy comprised of. But I think that's the, uh, the, the basics of what we would define heresy as at this time. So um, just kind of like hopping on top of that, um, with the late yeah. medieval period, or, sorry, I just said like the medieval period, looking like okay. the idea of heterodoxy, which is an even bigger word, um, how yeah. does that relate with her and the life of like Margaret Poirier and such? Yeah, so I think, I think Heather, I think, gosh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think looking back on her now, not as a Christian, or sorry, not as a historian, but as a Christian, uh, historians, you're not supposed to make judgments. So I would step away from my role as a historian just to look on her as a Christian. And I would say that she is in heterodoxy and that she does things a little bit differently but they're not contradicting the Christian faith. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so like taking at this time, not taking monastic vows, that's a head. That's what I think would be a heterodoxy. Um, saying faith alone is good enough. That'd be a hetero heterodoxy. Um, yeah. And then like there's other things about her, um, her idea of annihilation of the, the soul and of the will. Um, that would be a heterodoxy. Though at this time, there is no such thing as a heterodoxy. It's a uh, it's orthodoxy or nothing. And I think the 12, the, uh, the 1215 Fourth Amendment Council makes that very clear. So now being contemporary Christians, we will label things as heterodoxy. Um, things that you and I can disagree on, and that's okay. Um, our salvation is not up for stakes on it, but then we would affirm the creeds. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so beautiful, and like a Calvinist and a Molinist, or like a younger creationist mm -hmm. and an creationist, or like you know they can be like, yeah, we disagree on a lot, but we can hold hands and say, you know, this this Jesus guy, he really was who he says he was. It's such a beautiful thing. Um, Absolutely. Uh, with with Margaret Boyer. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, with with her view on sanctification, uh, justification by yeah. faith alone, that's something that not very common, uh, I think, in the in the medieval period with the the Catholics and such. Um, yeah. The church. So, like, when you look at her life, like, what did you think of? What do you think of like her view of sanctification? And how it like impacted her and her ministry and such? Yeah, so I think, I think her view of sanctification is is in line with that mystic tradition of love and euphoria, um, like wanting to know love God and knowing love God is a, is a spousal partner. Um, female mystics did it a lot. They would, um, like the Song of Songs, they would attribute to, to Jesus and they would sexualize Song of Songs a little bit more. Um, and that's where that, that love part comes in. Um, with Murray Port's sanctification and annihilation of the soul, um, I think it's a little bit radical in that way. She believes that we can annihilate our will or a self desire. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we take on the will of God completely. So we know God's will, God's thoughts. We become one with God. When she talks about the soul or spirit, she says that we get rid of our own soul and spirit, get the heck out of here. And we take on the Holy Spirit completely. Um, and she, she does this through a seven step process. Now, I don't focus on the seven steps in my thesis, but there's something along the lines of first acknowledging your worldliness, um, working to get rid of it by working for the people, serving the people. Beggings were probably the first, probably the most recognizable thing that we would see to nurses um be one of the earliest types of nurses that we we would recognize 
so they're treating lepers. They are um, preaching to people who are poor, or sick. Um, they have a very missional heart and a very um, yeah missional way way about them. Um, but it's, so it's doing those those kinds of things. Those are works, but that's not what earns you the salvation. Um, that's what helps to take away these worldly desires. And then once you've done away with your worldly desires, you start to set your heart on heart and mind on God. And then you start to enter this process of annihilation um, where you annihilate your own will. Once you've done that completely, Poirot says that you are taken up to heaven briefly to get a glimpse of heaven and what it looks like. And then you're brought back down to live the rest of your life, but through God's will completely. Mm. And so I think it's a really good thing to strive for. But I'm of the opinion with sanctification that um, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I think that there will always be sins that we struggle with and we wrestle with, even if we've we've conquered those sins through the help of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, there's always going to be a little nudge or something in the back of your head that wants you to do something. Um, but for Margaret Porette, it was more of a clear cut. You're sinful. Once you've done this certain thing, you're no longer sinful. Um, so it's unique and it's something that you, we should strive for to not be, be sinful. I just think it contradicts uh, inherent natures. Right, all right. So yeah. um, there's a lot here and we'll, we'll start to, if there's any live questions or stuff, we'll answer any questions or super chats. Um, but when you're looking Definitely. at like uh, the medieval period and like poor, poor Oh, yeah, whatever her name is. Um, just in like the looking at this like big picture, um, when you're looking at this all the way back and see everything, like what do you see and like how this relates to like God's grand story and how everything is kind of like folding together? Oh, that's a big one, man. I yeah, see, I didn't even give you that. That's all good. I like it though. Yeah, I think when I look at Porat, I look at what she's done, what she's written. I see, I see a church where it's okay to be, I mean, I'm some creature, but like it's okay to be different. Like we each have different spiritual gifts. We're all different parts of the body of Christ. Um, and when I look at Porat, I see a person, part of the body of Christ who want to serve God uh, and serve his people, but just did it in a time she was she was before her time i think hmm. um and i think it's important that we we realize that is that um even today there are people who are before the time perhaps to speak and i think it's good to be open but critical about things that we allow into the the, the body price that people are going to work in different ways and as long as for the orthodoxy of the Christian faith, that is the Athanasian Nicene Apostles' Creed. Um, a good conversation on heterodoxy um, and ways of being Jesus to people um, is going to be important. Mm, good stuff. Um, I don't think we have any questions, which must mean you must be perfect. But someone was asking, who's Layton Ryder? And Mr. Phil Fox said, all I know is <laughs> I got his butt kicked by Mr. Phil Fox and oh, uh, that's right. ruthless. <laughs> Mr. Phil, interesting. Throat today. <laughs> oh man, that... <laughs> Mr. Phil Fox. <laughs> now I'm gonna have Dang. to remove him because he was mean, and I wanted to be fun and friendly, and he's just like going for the throat. But uh, that was so good. Much fun stuff here late and not is there any kind of like closing thoughts things you want to share before we start to wrap things up here yeah well i mean i appreciate you having me on the, the show this was really good to talk about like yeah yeah like me medieval history it's it's important i love it i think it's important for especially christians i think it's really important for christians to to know it might not always be the most fun thing but it's where our theology comes from or a good a good chunk of it, especially if you're you're a Thomist or you're a Catholic. Um, I think it's really important to know where those theological roots come from and the environment that they came out of. 
Um, yeah, so I would definitely encourage people to look into your faith. Look at the whole history of Christianity, at the whole history of the eternal church and each Christian that's gone before you, what their experience was. And our experience is different in some ways, but similar in others. Looking at how Christians who have gone before us have conducted themselves in certain circumstances. Right now is a really confusing time, but the church has gone through arguably worse times. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to be rooted in that, that it's not just modern Christianity, that modern Christianity is just a very small part of a bigger picture. Yeah. Um, and that entire picture is the church of God and the church of Jesus Christ. We do have um, one question here, which is from Marcy Hernandez. Thank you for your question, Marcy, which says, uh, what is the value of Lateran 4 in light of this? Oh, gosh. I think I know Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> it, I don't know if she's talking about the Fourth Lateran Council. Probably. I don't know. Like, the, the, value, of, the value of Fourth Lateran Council was like, set the, the standard for Christianity up until the Council of Trent. Um, I haven't read the whole Fourth Lateran Council. I've only read the parts that are important to me. Uh, and my, my thesis and my ar argument. Uh, but if this is the person that I know, then we can talk about it later. <laughs> Good stuff, Layton. Well, it's been so much fun, man. Uh, thanks for having, thanks for coming on. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Zach. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and this is it here in Apologetics, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. As always, if you're new to the show, I encourage you to subscribe. We're listening via podcast or on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, leave a like or a review on your way out. That helps a lot. Um, if you enjoyed the show, you can support us on patreon.com slash if you're in apologetics. We're like 85% funded, so your support of $1, 2 $3 a month means a lot. Uh, so appreciate that. But Leighton, thank you so much, man. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks so much. See you guys. See you guys. And you can follow Leighton down.